This program's brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. Today, we take a look at the Society of St. Andrew. They're gleaning the fields and feeding the hungry. Then, Mark Viette shows us how to add color during the winter in the garden. We'll also have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus your Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. It's apple season in Virginia and many more Virginia grown apples are now being sold directly to consumers instead of being processed for juice and sauce. Experts believe the local foods movement has boosted sales of apples right from the orchard. And many parts of Virginia have ideal apple growing conditions with limestone soil, good elevation and lots of light. Apples are raised on 733 Virginia farms. According to the USDA, they accounted for about $31 million in cash receipts last year. More Virginia apples are also being consumed in the liquid form with the growing industry of hard cider. Well, it's also digging season for Virginia's wild ginseng root. The root of the American ginseng plant is valued as a medicinal herb and approximately 5,700 pounds of ginseng roots were harvested in Virginia last year with a value of about $2.7 million. Now it takes between 250 and 300 roots to acquire a pound of wild ginseng but that pound is currently worth $1,200. Wild American ginseng is listed as a threatened species in Virginia, and VDAX is responsible for regulating ginseng harvest and sales in the Commonwealth. Well, the nation's cow herd is beginning to expand, and that means cattle producers across the country are faced with important decisions on how to build back their inventories. Experts say it's a great opportunity to build on quality. Bob Cervera has a story. You know the story. The national cow herd dropped from 40 million cows to 28 million. John Patterson with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association explains why. And many of us would say it was due to the drought, okay? But there's about five reasons more than the drought, and there were issues like high feed prices, the age of the producers, certain uh, demographic or producers are leaving the ex exiting the industry. Uh, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, a lot of our producers just couldn't believe what they were paying us for our calves and for our replacement heifers, even our cows and bulls. So we didn't keep them back, we sold them. But times are good, and that encourages rebuilding. The future's pretty bright, actually. We think at least until 2020, we're gonna see some pretty strong cattle prices. Maybe not as high as 2014, but uh, they're gonna be high prices, profitable prices, at least to 2017, probably more like 2020. Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas have seen the biggest jumps in cow inventory, and 60% of the heifer retention is from those three states. But all across the U.S., Patterson says this rebuilding phase represents a chance to make herd improvements. We got rid of our low end of the cow herd. We got rid of the, the less productive cows. I think we've got a pretty young cow herd with pretty good genetics in the United States. We've got a great opportunity to continue to build on quality. He says it's just a matter of using all the genetic and management tools available today. Now you can find these bulls in the catalogs that will help you on, on birth weight, weaning weight, yearling weight, profitability on there. And so if we'll use that technology, I think the future is really bright. You're going to provide what that consumer is asking. Once again, tender, juicy, flavorful beef. And we've got the genetics to provide that in the country. I'm Bob Cervera. Thanks, Bob. Well, not since 1989 has the sale of champions been held at the Virginia State Fair. But according to State Fair Livestock Manager Glenn Martin, that's changing this year. Uh, it was decided to return to the sale of champions because uh, we were looking at a way to bring more attention to the uh, youth livestock program and shows, and also a way to sort of uh, 
give more opportunities for the students to uh, earn more scholarships. The sale of champions differs from state to state, but the Virginia sale will auction off eight animals, the grand and reserve champions of market beef, lambs, goats, and swine. Uh, our program is a little bit different. Uh, it's pretty much when somebody bids on the animal, it's almost like a donation to support the program. Uh, the animal will still remain in the, in the system and uh, will go on and compete with carcass contests and so forth. So. Now the carcass contest is based on meat production. When the animals are slaughtered, they are judged on which one has the most ideal meat. As for the kids, Martin says the sale of champions allows for more scholarship money. It will also allow us to offer a program where the students can apply for scholarships and we'll have funds uh, available this winter uh, and we hope to offer, I believe it's uh, 12 scholarships where the, all the kids that participate in the youth livestock program will be able to apply for. Because the sale of champions is charitable by nature, these animals bring high dollar and those dollars can help a lot of kids pay for college. Over the years, uh, we've had students that have had over $20,000 in scholarship money, so it, it does help. The sale of champions will be held Saturday, October 3rd in the First Bank and Trust Company Pavilion on the south side of the fairgrounds at 6 p.m. Earlier this year, Virginia Beach High School student won an international contest for the World of Seven Billion, a student video contest sponsored by Population Connection. Clint Hours has the story. Madison Bernier, a very insightful Virginia Beach High School student, produced a video that sends a powerful message to the world. By shifting our agricultural strategy, we can better manage our food and natural resources, and this will help us feed an exponentially growing world population. Well, I was taking AP Human Geography, and my teacher, Ms. Haig, for an assignment, we had to make a video to enter into the world of seven billion, and I like, I really wanted to like make a really good video and put it in and like try and actually like win because it's a really cool international contest. I think because all of us we're going to have our kids one day and grandchildren and I think we're all going to want them to have healthy foods and we're going to want them to be able to have the same lifestyle we did. The contest World of Seven Billion is sponsored by Population Connection and had Madison competing with youth from around the globe. The contest aims to educate young people about global population growth and how to best use the Earth's resources to feed that population. Well, we have a textbook. We had our textbook, so I tried to like look through that to get some ideas, and then I went on and like researched some information and kind of looked up what I needed to put in and fit it all into a minute. Here's the video that Madison produced for the contest. 7.2 billion, the number of people in the world today. 2.5 billion. The expected increase to the world's population in the next 35 years. Currently, 40% of the Earth's land mass is devoted to agriculture, and 55% of all food crops grown are used to feed people today. With our ever-changing climate, pollution issues, massive deforestation, limited water supply, and most of the world's sustainable farmland under cultivation, how do we feed the future population without expanding our agriculture footprint? The solutions are attainable. By modifying existing farming practices such as crop rotation, natural pest controllers, and vertical farming techniques, we can become more efficient producers. Additionally, by simply reducing food waste, decreasing meat consumption, and moving towards a more plant-based diet, we can meet the future population food needs. Shift the strategy, feed the future population. Any high school students interested in participating in next year's World of Seven Billion contest, here's the information you'll need. Just go to www.populationeducation.org. Reporting for Virginia Farming, this is Clint Hours. Thanks, Clint. Food waste is definitely a problem, but one Virginia-based ministry is helping to eliminate that problem. We'll talk with Betty Heishman with the Society of St. Andrew, next on Ag Insights. Today we're in Clearbrook, Virginia, and we're visiting a cornfield that's being gleaned by the Society of St. Andrew. I'm joined by one of their gleaning coordinators here in the Winchester area, Betty Heishman. Betty, thank you so much for having us out today. You're very welcome. Can you give us some background about the Society of St. Andrew? Yes, I can. Uh, it was started in the early 80s. 
uh, by two families who had a vision for doing something with all the food that's going to waste in this country. And so they worked for a while and things didn't develop right away, but they finally got a break when a farmer offered them a tractor trailer load of sweet potatoes. And so for there, they went into accepting loads of sweet potatoes and dropping them off at different agencies and, and churches and organizations that would bag those potatoes and distribute them locally to their agencies. So that has been going on ever since. So that was the start. And then we come into the gleaning a little bit later. And uh, that's where we got interested. We, at a church conference, we um, found out and talked to the founders and found out what was happening. And we was very impressed because there's so much food in this area that goes to waste and you drive through the orchards and you drive down the roads and you see it all. So anyway, that's, that's how we got involved and we've been there ever since. So really the Society of St. Andrew was formed to help feed the hungry. It was, it was a dream of the two families that they could feed every family in America with what is going to waste. Okay. And that actually is a true reality. Uh, in 2010, the USDA, uh, said that one-third of all the crops grown in this country go to waste. They're never used. So that's a third. If you take that by how many people actually don't have food, it's just the idea of how you get it from where it's at to those that need it. And this gleaning is just perfect. And uh, because we find the farmers, or they find us, they give us a call, we send out the word to all of our volunteers, and... Um, set up a date, a time, and we go out and gather the food. And then we have, we have a schedule of all the agencies in the area and out of the area that take food. And um, we know what day they give out food so we can offer it to them fresh. Okay. And hopefully what we got here today will be on tables tonight. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about gleaning. What exactly is, what does the word gleaning mean? It is... Uh, gathering usable food that is not going to be used by the farmer. He has all he wants and he has a certain amount left. In, in Bible times, in, in the Old Testament times, gleaning was the word used for all the farmers would leave the corners of their fields. They wouldn't touch them. So the widows and the travelers and people coming through would have something to eat. So the Society of St. Andrew has really grown. How many, how many offices are there in the United States? I think there, is, there are 15, I know there are 15 states that we have offices in. Okay. Uh, Virginia has one main office, which I work with. And then in each state, there's different groups like the Winchester District, and there's right. different districts where the coordinators do the work. And the headquarters for the Society of St. Andrew is here in Virginia, correct? Yes, it's in Big Island, Virginia, very close to Lynchburg. Okay. Yeah. What types of food do you guys generally glean? Okay. Is it, are we seeing corn? Mm -hmm. We're in the middle of a cornfield. <laughs> is corn or is it a myriad of different things? It's anything that grows in this area that is available to us. Any crop, any vegetable, any fruit that's available. Um, and we've gleaned just about everything there is. We're doing, this week we're doing uh, more corn. We did peaches yesterday. Tomorrow we're gleaning tomatoes. The next day we'll be back here for corn and then it just goes in cycles. However, whatever's fresh right now is what we're going after. And all of this is run strictly by vol with volunteers, yes, correct? Yes, it's, it's all volunteer work. It's, it's nobody paid. So how do you find the fields? How do farmers find you or do you go find the farmers? How does that work? Well, it kind of works both ways and this what you're doing here with this interview is, is a big way to help because people that aren't aware that this is happening uh, can be informed as to what we're doing and, and that's how it kind of grows from one. And then volunteers go back home to their church and community and they tell what we did and that they enjoyed it so it spreads okay. that way. So. This morning we've seen corn being gleaned here in this field. It was picked, it was bagged by the dozen, and it was put into this van and another truck has already left. Yes. Where will this corn end up and how does it get there? Okay. Today, 
most of the corn will be here in this local area because we don't have any volunteers. Uh, we did have two volunteers from McLean, Virginia, and they took back to a place called Shear in McLean. But other than that, this corn today will be distributed locally. Um, probably Salvation Army, um, several soup kitchens. I will be taking some by the senior centers in Winchester and Stephen City. And, and that's, you know, just basically where it'll go. Now the soup kitchens and places like that, do you go by there because you know there's a need or have they contacted you to say anything you get, please drop it off, we can use it? No, mostly we contact them to see if they want any of our products and mostly they do. So, so who handles that? Who handles the logistics of, okay, this soup kitchen uh, around the Winchester area is going to need corn today? Okay. Who who okay. does that? And okay, well I have a list, and I have I know by now by memory what days these pantries give out: Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever. So we know if we pick corn here today, we don't want to deliver it to one that's not going to uh, give it out until Monday. We want one where it's going to go out fresh today. So that's what we do. And, and you know, I handle that. Okay, yeah, putting that together. And you mentioned the word fresh, and I think that's so important because. I keep reading about, number one, all the waste, the food that is wasted in our country. And number two, about the quality of food that soup kitchens and food pantries are, are getting donated. It's all canned and very processed food. They don't have access maybe to something this fresh all the time. So, right. Yeah, and a, another problem too is that it wasn't a problem before, but it is now because people are used to eating that type of processed food. We have to educate people at these pantries and all. We have to educate them on how to prepare this food because they're not used to fresh food. I had a load one day. I was unloading on a very poor section of town at a little church, and three boys come down the street, young boys, and I said, hey, you guys, you want to help me? And I had all these boxes of heavy cucumbers, and I said, help me carry these down these steps. So they did, and we finished. I gave them each a cucumber, and they didn't know what it was. And that's here in Virginia where we kind of feel like everybody knows about agriculture and everybody has access to it, but they don't. They don't. Evidently, these young boys had not been in a grocery store because it was strange. They didn't even know what this was. So uh, it's, it's really a different time, and we've got to... Instead of just handing them something, we have to educate them on how it's to be used and how they can take advantage of it. Okay. So when it comes down to the farmer, are there advantages for the farmer to be associated with the Society of St. Andrew? Okay. Well, here in Virginia, there is um, a state tax credit that they receive. It's a, a small amount they get for how many ever pounds we, we always I have to keep records and, and make reports on each gleaning of who was here and, and all that and how many pounds we took out. And they will give them, uh, they divide it up. All the farmers don't get a total um, credit for it, but they divide it up between all the farmers for how much they're allowed for the state and they do get something. Okay, all right. Now, if a farmer wants to become part of this gleaning process with the Society of St. Andrew, what should they do? They can contact St. Andrew uh, at endhunger.org or they can call them at 800-333-4597 or they can contact me at my email is gleaningworks at gmail.com. Well, the farmer that planted all of this corn is here this morning and we're gonna go talk to him. Betty, thank you so much for having us having us out. You're welcome. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you. So we've caught up with Bill Klein. He's the farmer who owns and planted all the corn that's being gleaned today. Bill, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. So give us an idea of the size of this corn plot. There's between six and a half and seven acres here. Okay. And this is all sweet corn, and what do you do with that sweet corn? We have a small fruit stand here, and we sell most of it right there, but what's left over, we call the Society of St. Andrews in, and they harvest what we leave. Okay. Why do you do that? I've been blessed with an abundant amount of corn, 
and we plant corn every other, every week, and we move on to fresher and better corn. So I'm looking at the corn that these guys have picked, and it looks perfectly good to me. Why, why is this corn being left behind? It's just leave, being left behind because we move on to the next one before it gets further on in development. Okay. What are some of the advantages of being involved with the Society of St. Andrew? The, being involved with St. Andrews has enabled me to pick up extra tax credits f from Society of St. Andrews. They write the credits and, and they've been very good. Well, is this something you would suggest other farmers do? Sure. Anybody that's got anything left over, I mean, there's too many hungry people out there today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. We Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you for coming. We'll be right back. Adding color to your winter garden can be as easy as selecting the right trees. With tips, here's Mark Viette. To create interest during the winter when all the leaves are gone, you really want to have something in a garden that brightens up the garden or shows off something different. And in this case, you can choose trees that have a specific exfoliating bark that is beautiful in the winter and even attractive during the summer months. This is one of the Chinese dogwoods, and behind me I have one of our native dogwoods. Really doesn't have what I call interesting bark, but this bark on this tree starts to shed, and you can even peel it off just like this. In every place where I'm peeling off this bark, it's lightly colored, and throughout the season, some of these portions become really lightly colored. I'll show you some things later that sort of look like a giraffe's neck. Many of us are familiar with cherries. Cherries have beautiful bark, could be quite shiny when they're younger, but remember these words, tree lilac. Right in here we have planted a few of these easy to grow yellow blooming trees. They bloom sometime in June and it's known as the Japanese tree lilac. And look at the bark. Yeah, to me, it would seem that this is the cherry tree until I look up towards the top or see it blooming with yellow flowers, just like your lilacs, end of May or June. One of my top five favorite small trees with beautiful exfoliating bark is the crepe myrtle. And just imagine a giraffe's neck. And this is a, a small tree that does not get too large in diameter. And if you look, you can see the alternating colors, the cinnamon and the pale, almost whitish color. And you can actually see, and this is kind of neat, the way this bark just peels right off the tree. Here is some of the bark that still was at the base of the tree. In addition to this bark that peeled off this year, this new bark is really smooth. It's almost velvety. Just imagine you're somewhere in the tropics. So you might want to consider planting three or four or five of these in your garden. And the one thing you want to look for is the variety that is called Natchez. It's a pure white flower. Maybe not as pretty as the pinks and the reds, but it does have the best exfoliating bark. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at the ag calendar, the State Fair of Virginia is scheduled to begin Friday, September 25th and run through Saturday, October 3rd. For event schedules and more information, visit statefairva.org. The 10th annual McCormick Farm Mill Day will take place Saturday, October 3rd in Rafine. The main attraction will be the operation of the McCormick Grist Mill, which was built in the 1700s. There will also be farm tours, food, crafts, and music. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. 